Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome um, along to this second in a series of four Meet the Researcher uh, webinars on the subject of water. Um, my name is Martin Tillotson, um, and I'm a director of Water at Leeds, and I'm delighted to be able to act as your host uh, for this webinar um, today. Um, before we start, just two or three quick announcements, if I may. The first one is that the webinar is being recorded um, and the recording will um, be placed shortly after the end of the webinar on the Leeds Alumni and Advancement YouTube page. So if you're not able to stay to the end um, today, or in fact, if you wish to come back and review um, and indeed look at any of the other webinars in the series, then they're all available on the, uh, on the YouTube channel. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second um, announcement is um, we encourage you all um, to ask questions as we go along. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of uh, the, um, the, the of Paul's speech today, um, and we will try and get through as many of the questions as we can. Now, if you do want to ask a question, um, if you click on the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, um, then you'll be able to type your question into the field there, um, and you'll also be able to see the questions that other viewers have posed as well. Um, and if you like the sound of any particular question, um, then please feel free to upvote for that. And we will try and select the ones that uh, the most people, most people are interested in uh, knowing the answers for. Um, and then the final announcement is, is that there is live captioning available on the webinar. Um, so if you have any accessibility issues, then please feel free to, uh, to activate this also at the bottom of the screen now. Okay, so um, I don't know um, how many of you were able to join us during last week's webinar, but if you were, um, you'll remember that we had a, a very interesting um, talk from my colleague in the School of Politics and International Studies, Professor Anna Madi, um, who talked to us about some of the important challenges facing water. Um, and one of the things that we did during that webinar, webinar is that we started to frame those questions and the discussion um, at different scales. Um, so if you remember, um, we, at, at, at one end of the spectrum, um, we were talking about perhaps your own personal water consumption. So, you know, the water that you might consume at home or, in, in, uh, or at work in the office. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we were talking about water at the global scale. So perhaps water where it uh, flows between political boundaries or indeed water that is incorporated into um, the sorts of goods and services um, that we produce and that we trade in. Um, one of the things that Anna um, then went on to describe is how some of the challenges um, around our um, engagement with water and the movement of water through the environment can start to affect us, you know, and that, that impact can come not just from an environmental perspective, but also from a, a social um, and, a, and an economic perspective. And the work that Anna had been doing was really to try and encapsulate that um, into a series of questions, if you like, um, that um, were, were seen as imperatives for, for, for being answered when it comes to looking at water, um, you know, right around the world. So not just in the UK, but on a global basis. And so out of the synthesis of that work, Anna was able to find that we, we had, in fact, um, six priority themes. Um, so what we want to do over the next two weeks and over the next three webinars is, is start to really kind of drill down into into some of those themes, not all of them, um, but into some of those themes. Um, and one of those themes really is around um, the provision of clean water um, and also in ensuring sanitation um, for people. Now, one of the Millennium Development Goals, as I'm sure our speaker tonight will come on to mention, um, one of the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals is around the provision of clean water and also the provision of uh, sanitation um, for, for everybody, no matter where they are in the world. Um, and if you think about perhaps, you know, we live in, in the United Kingdom, we're, we're, we're in the global north, you think about the way in which we use water, 
um, particularly when it comes to things like you know hygiene and sanitation um, it's very much a kind of flush and forget approach that we have um, and, and, and what the purpose of water in all of that really is to is to transfer pollution from where it's produced you know and where it can cause harm um, or where it can affect health um, into a place a remote location where um, hopefully that, uh, that pollution can be removed from the water and that water can then be returned to the environment. Um, and, and of course, you know, clean water or fresh water, I should say, is a finite resource. Um, and so we're not just removing the pollution um, from that water from, from an environmental point of view, but we're also removing it so that that water can be um, reused as well, not just by current the current generation, but of course, we need to ensure that the quality of that water is preserved um, so that it can be used by future generations um, as well. So that's the kind of situation in the global north. The situation in the global south is often quite different. Um, and when I think about, you know, perhaps marginalized populations, populations of people that don't have access um, to safe water or to safe sanitation i often think about people that live you know perhaps in, in in rural locations where you know maybe it's not economically viable or technically viable to um you know to 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 connect people up to a water supply or to a uh, a sewer network um, and yet you know sure those those populations um do form part of this um, um you know this 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 disadvantaged group um, but moreover I also think about, um, you know, much larger, much, much densely, um, much more densely populated areas of the world, particularly in the global south, where, um, um, you know, large populations exist side by side. Um, you know, perhaps they live in informal developments or, or shanty towns um, where there's no planned urban development. Um, and where you know connection to services um, just doesn't doesn't happen, or or if it does happen, it's it's very um, sporadic. And of course, in these locations, if you don't have access to a safe supply of drinking water, and if you don't have access to a network that can take away your wastewater, um, and you, you're not then actually removing the pollution from where it's created. Um, and that therefore presents a health risk and it also presents a disease risk. Um, and, it, and in fact, as I'm sure our speaker will come on to say in a few minutes, there are around 4 billion people in the world that don't have access to safe sanitation. Um, so I'd like now, if I can, um, to introduce you to our speaker this evening. Um, our, speak to, our speaker is Dr. Paul Hutchings. Paul is a, uh, a lecturer in Water Sanitation and Health based in the School of Civil Engineering here at the University of Leeds. Um, now, Paul's research is very interdisciplinary in its nature. Um, and what he's able to do or what he's able to bring to water at Leeds is a social science perspective on what are ostensibly some very technical problems. Um, and so obviously it's important then when we're thinking about engineered solutions um, and things like that, um, that we get the social context of those solutions absolutely right, um, because it's only by getting that right that um, we're going to maximise the uh, the, be the benefit and 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 the use from um, enhanced uh, levels of sanitation. Um, so, if I can, I'd like to um, bring Paul in. Hi, Paul. Hello. Hello. And I'll, I'll hand it to you if that's okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, Martin, for the kind introduction and the framing and good evening to everyone and uh, welcome uh, to this Meet the Researchers session. So my topic, which I'm going to talk us through uh, this evening, is around improving urban sanitation around the world. And what I'm going to do is present a kind of bit of a backdrop to this situation with trying to think about what is it, uh, what are the main challenges and why is there a deficiency in uh, safely managed sanitation that's high quality uh, toilets or other or latrines for populations and appropriate waste management systems. And then I'm going to move on to some of the research that we at the University of Leeds 
um, water sanitation and hygiene group, the WASH group, which is based in the School of Civil Engineering, um, are conducting to help uh, address some of these challenges. Before we get into the technical content, I just want to recognise that sanitation is a human right. Uh, and when we do not have adequate systems for managing waste flows, particularly in cities, um, it, it creates very hostile environments for people to live. This is a picture from Ghana of a uh, slum area where there's a particularly high concentration of waste. The visible waste here is, is actually solid waste, which we would use you know, municipal uh, waste collection systems for, but it intersects a lot with um, san sanitary or sanitation problems related to excreta and wastewater, which we will go on to discuss. Um, as I said, urban environments with these inadequate systems become very inhospitable places to live. And whenever we're thinking about this, we we start from thinking about the public health implications because the infectious disease burden in environments like this is very high. There's also um, other forms of pollutants that cause toxic um, problems in populations. And this really impacts people that live in these types of environments, particularly the very young, the very old and disabled or people with um, compromised immune systems. So really, when we're thinking about improving sanitation and improving it globally, we're really um, our group at Leeds, the, the WASH group is really trying to focus on trying to create uh, solutions and evidence that helps improve and eventually eradicate these types of uh, situations from from occurring. Um, so if we're defocused from a kind of particular setting, thinking about that population and zoom out to see the global uh, sanitation picture, this, this figure here is from the WHO and UNICEF, and it, on the vertical axis it shows the, the percentage of the global population, and then the horizontal axis is, is time. And uh, the solid lines are current progress with real data that we, we know at the global population level. And then the dots are the, 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 the dotted lines here are the projections that we would need in terms of the rates of progress to hit the sustainable development goal uh, in 2030, which is for um, universal safely managed sanitation. So the, two, the three figures here to just give us this picture, global picture of what's going on, the top line is um, the global population that um, is no, which has some form of toilet. So they are not open defecating. And um, in about 2000, about 80% of the world did, but about just over 20% of the world uh, still open defecated. Um, Around 2016, when this data was collected, uh, around 91% of global population. And by 2030, we uh, predict and estimate that effectively it, we will be at universal coverage of some form of sanitation facility for, for, all the, for the whole global population. So that's reason to celebrate somewhat, somewhat in terms of uh, global progress in this space. The uh, line here for basic sanitation is basic is ha someone having a, a high quality toilet that separates them hygienically from their excreta and waste. And globally, um, in 2000, only a bit over half the global population had a, a form of toilet that we would uh, classify as, as meeting this criteria. Um, but by about 2016, the the rate of progress had had uh, improved a bit and we were looking about three quarters of the global population but there still is approximately about 20 percent of global population without a uh, well-designed sanitation facility that separates them from their waste when they use it and actually to achieve the sustainable development goal if we projected uh, using a kind of linear trajectory, we are not going to hit that and we need to increase the rate of progress in this space uh, by to double it to actually hit the sustainable development goal uh, for basic sanitation. Now, this bottom figure is for uh, something we call safely managed sanitation, which is what I'm going to go on to explain and what we're really going to unpack in this lecture. And safely managed sanitation is people that have a good quality toilet at home and all the waste that is collected 
within that toilet or flush down it is safely managed all the way through various processes till it's disposed of safely in the environment. And that's really what safe sanitation is. It's the whole holistic chain, not just a toilet. And when we think about that globally, uh, well under half the population in 2000 um, had uh, safely managed sanitation with properly managed excreta all the way along the, the sanitation value chain. And by uh, 2016, 2017, it was still less than half. It's probably about half now, maybe just a bit over. And although the Sustainable Development Goals commit us to trying to achieve universal sanitation, safely managed sanitation by 2030, uh, we are very far off from meeting that. And the rate of progress for these types of holistic properly managed sanitation systems would need to increase fourfold for the world to hit this. And realistically, we're not going to do that. That's going to universal safely managed sanitation is going to take another few decades. So I just want to think a little bit about what is a sanitation system and particularly to understand this concept of a safely managed sanitation system. So in our space, we often talk about a sanitation service chain, which uh, which in the UK and for our UK uh, listeners and, and attendees tonight, uh, typically involves a sewer based system. And we can see here a kind of uh, some pictures and a, a model of what this looks like. So we would have a flush toilet in our home, in the institutions we work, our schools, our healthcare facilities. The toilet uh, is waterborne, the waste is flushed away, there's a conveyance system using the sewerage system, water carries our waste at very diluted rates away from um, where we live, where people congregate, um, often using gravity, sometimes with pumping systems, to a treatment plant. That treatment plant processes the waste and produces normally two outputs, one an effluent, which is a liquid output, which we dispose of under regulated controls into our waterways, into rivers and so forth, and also a, a solid component, what we call sludge or biosolids, which we often put into the agricultural system, which is often not recognized, um, or at times we it goes to landfill. So when we're thinking about safely managed sanitation, we need to make sure that the waste is managed completely along this chain. In the UK, actually, interestingly, at the moment, there's a lot of public discourse about failures in our sanitation system, and I will touch on that briefly. But most of my presentation will focus on on-site systems, or on non sewered systems, or what are sometimes called on-site sanitation systems. I'm not sure whether you can see this, I'll just get rid of that. So these types of systems are ones um, where the where the facility where people go, the toilet or the latrine, actually also includes um, a capture element. So there's a storage and partial treatment of the waste at the user interface. And most typically, uh, these are what we could be associated with, say, pit latrines, but also septic tanks, um, which can be waterborne, are also a form of on-site sanitation. But in these cases, the waste uh, congregates in the, in near to the user interface, and at some point has to be, uh, at least a component of that waste has to be emptied. Um, and there is a process of hopefully mechanical emptying, though very sadly, often around the world, that is manually emptied, a very dangerous job, uh, which is uh, often technically illegal in many countries, but is widely practiced. It then is normally transported through this road network to a disposal site, and it goes into a sludge treatment. And again, there will be uh, a lower level of effluent, some liquid effluent, but mostly it will be uh, a biosolid output that is then uh, put to land. And so when we're thinking about uh, sanitation systems and what, what makes a good sanitation system, we need to think not just about whether there are the toilet is safe, but whether that whole system is safe. And so this is a conceptual model we use in the sanitation space that the WHO developed, 
We used to use uh, something called the F diagram, the fecal flow diagram, but now this is the kind of redeveloped conceptual model to think about sanitation and health impact, particularly infectious disease. And in this case, we can think that a user uses a sanitation system, they excrete feces and urine, and they could not have a sanitation system, and that waste could go on safely into the environment. They could have a containment system, but there could be failures or leakages or some other problem where there is a health hazard. Equally, in the storage component, it could uh, leak. Um, it, it could leak or it could discharge into a dangerous place, and there could be sanitation hazards in this space. When it is uh, conveyed, either via a tanker or even in a sewer, it could leak out, it could be disposed of in the wrong site, and similarly treatment systems can be underpowered, and then what we dispose of in the environment can be still be dangerous. And all, in all this space, we can create sanitation hazards that then go through various environmental pathways to lead to exposure and public health problems. And the concept of safely managed sanitation is making sure that whole system from user to disposal runs uh, safely and sufficiently. So I just wanted to touch on this. So yesterday I was at a community event in Knaresborough in Yorkshire talking with lots of people talking about uh, combined sewer overflow discharges uh, into, the, into the river Nid there. And you know, there's currently a lot of interest in U the UK water sector and the wastewater discharges into our waterways. And although lots of my research is global, it's actually quite interesting to think about this concept of safely managed systems and whether the UK, in all our systems, we are in the global database at 100%, but whether we, whether actually there are types of sanitation failures in the UK, particularly uh, in terms of um, wastewater being disposed of before it before it gets treated, which could uh, mean that we are, you know, unsafely managing our systems. I would say that all the discharges in the UK are normally within regulatory permit. Um, what effectively happens is that we have combined sewer systems, so you get stormwater mixing with the wastewater from your houses, and the system is designed. Uh, so that when um, there is lots of stormwater in the system, uh, rather than take too much water to the wastewater treatment plant, which could flood the plant, could knock out the processes, it diverts automatically. It's passive. No one's doing anything. It's engineered with a weir in the system, and that takes the wastewater directly into the river. The problem is we haven't really upgraded our sewer systems for over 100 years. And our settlements are much bigger. They have much more concrete and pavement and less permeable services. So, and with climate change, rain, rainfall is increasing. So we're getting a lot more days, a lot more events where that happens. And it's a massive political issue at the moment. Um, and this is just, uh, you know, uh, an example of a, a, a newspaper article and some data I picked up off the BBC of the times that there was this direct discharge of raw sewage into UK waterways. So something just to think about. What I want to come back to is really this global narrative that a key thing to recognise when we're thinking about global the global sanitation crisis is that much of the world rely on non-sewered sanitation. It's actually about half and half of the global population that have a decent sanitation system rely on sewers and half rely on non uh, on-site sanitation or non-site systems and uh, the projected growth when we're going to try and include those additional populations to get good services are overwhelmingly going to be served with on-site systems or these non-sewered systems and lots of the research in our group is about trying to understand how they function how we can make them work more efficiently, how we can make them um, yeah, be safer for public health and deliver better outcomes for, for populations. Just to kind of now take that global picture and to come to a particular city, these are two figures uh, from Nairobi showing uh, the, the, the urban plan of Nairobi in Kenya. 
And on the left hand side, it shows the main utility that operates in Nairobi's uh, water network. And uh, it's, it's the main transmission lines rather than every uh, house connection or anything. But I'm not sure how well you can see, but the, the transmission lines for the water network go all the way out to the edge of the city in almost every direction. There's reasonably good coverage. When you compare that to the public sewer network in Nairobi, the sewer network in Nairobi, and this is typical of developing cities, is really concentrated in the central business districts, diplomatic quarter, the high affluent areas. And the rest of the city all around here has no sewers. And so that part of the city is reliant on on-site sanitation systems or non-sewered sanitation. And one of the key problems this creates is not, as well as it being a technical problem, it creates a, what I would call a kind of political economy problem around who should invest in those types of systems. And I'm just going to unpack a typical uh, political economy dynamic, which happens in Nairobi and it happens in many developing cities. And then I'm gonna link it to some of how the University of Leeds research is trying to overcome some of these issues. So first of all, political economy is about the economy, money and politics and how they intersect. And when you do studies on the financial cost of building and running different types of sanitation systems, repeatedly the total annualized costs, including the cost for building and operating the system for sewer-based systems is, often, is many times higher than non sewage sanitation systems. So you could build an effective, safely managed non-sewer sanitation system for less than you can build an effective sewer-based system. However, sewer-based systems are used at costs, are used, usually borne directly by a water and sanitation utility, which collects tariffs, which will cover some of the costs, but also receives government subsidy, and in certain cities, subsidy from uh, the aid um, sector as well, or, or support uh, concessionary loans from people like the World Bank. And lots of the subsidy for sanitation therefore gets poured into the sewer-based systems, but they tend to cover the central business districts and wealthy areas of the city. Whereas non-sanitation costs, although they're lower, are off almost exclusively borne directly as by households themselves. So people living outside the central business districts and wealthy areas of the city don't receive subsidy. They pay for their own latrine. They build their own septic tank. When they want it emptied, they pay a private sector supplier to come and empty it. And there's very little subsidy that goes into these types of systems. And this results in massive underinvestment in non sewer sanitation and in inequity between service areas. So some of the work that we do in uh, my our research group at the University of Leeds working on WASH include kind of bringing together kind of technical understanding with this political and economy understanding to develop tools to support better uh, decision making. So this is the first example of a piece of work uh, done within our group. Um, not done actually directly by me, led by uh, the head of the group, Professor Barbara Evans. Um, and it's the development of a tool called, which intentionally to shock people is called the ship flow diagram tool, but is sometimes also uh, known as the excreta flow diagram. And the whole intention of this is to try and support better understanding of how the whole city sanitation system operates and then allow and advocate for people to prioritize public investment in areas that make the most difference. So I'm going to quickly explain it now. On the vertical axes, it started with three potential sources of wastewater or excreta that can occur within the city. And so one area is offsite sanitation, which are sewer based systems. Offsite is another word for them. Another area is on-site sanitation, and then another potential source of excreta or waste into the environment is open defecation. We then map 
through uh, participatory uh, sector-wide planning exercise, bringing in together data, bringing in experts that work in the city to try and create robust, evidence, robust estimates, how much of the waste from each area or each component of the whole city sanitation system is safely managed at each stage. And this basically allows us to estimate where the most critical failure points are in the whole city sanitation system. And what it often does is when you're sitting with city planners and other people, it makes them look beyond the sewer system to realize that there is more waste being managed through on-site sanitation systems, and the failures in those on-site sanitation systems are greater, therefore contributing in aggregate much more excreta and wastewater directly into the environment. And so this is a this is a ship flow diagram from uh, Kampala in Uganda, and it shows that some of the biggest failures are actually in uh, what's called in this categorization fecal sludge not properly contained. So this is poorly designed latrines and septic tanks that are located either in areas with very high water tables where we know the uh, the wastes are not safely contained are now leaching directly into the groundwater or for example discharge directly into drainage rather than wastewater sewers. Um, and in a way, you don't need to understand this, but part of this whole uh, tool is the visualization of the problem to allow people that already work in the sector to really identify and prioritize where to make investments. And so this is a, uh, um, a quote from Professor Barbara Evans on about the use of the tool. So the tool has been now used in over 235 cities worldwide. It's helped to inform hundreds of millions of pounds uh, dollars of investment. Um, and this is a map, for example, of South Asia showing all the cities in which ship flow diagrams have been constructed by local stakeholders to help them understand their sanitation systems. Um, and you can see it's very dense application, particularly in Bangladesh and in some of the key urban corridors of, of India. Um, and Professor Evans here in her quote really outlines the thing. What the impact of these diagrams is right from the start. They 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 impact civic leaders and mayors. They're horrified at how much waste, when they think beyond the sewer network, is actually being unsafely managed into their environment. And it makes them prioritize trying to invest, improve regulation, for example, improve the development of underpinning infrastructure like fecal sludge management systems, which are needed to create on-site sanitation systems that are safely managed. Just to say this initiative has involved University of Leeds, it's involved many other partners as well. We are a small component, but it shows you the type of applied um, research we try and do that is at that kind of interface of um, engineering, planning, social political understanding, and that includes lots of engagement with governments and development sector actors, as well as uh, fellow academics and researchers. I'm gonna talk about another project now, uh, which is a live project which I'm working on, which is focused on um, evaluating um, a new sanitation uh, or relatively new sanitation service delivery system for slums. So, in the lowest income countries, so in low income countries, about 66% of the urban population live in what would we would classify as um, informal, unplanned urban environments where um, planned infrastructure is basically absent or has been ad hocly added um, afterwards. Um, they, urban slums are probably the hardest environment in the world to deliver safely managed sanitation. The, the problems are driven by limited space. Um, it's very high density. There's very limited land tenure. So people don't have the rights um, to their lands. So they might be moved on. So they're not willing to invest in permanent infrastructure. The governments don't recognize them. So they will uh, rarely actually invest in it themselves. The people living in these environments are financially poor and therefore will not don't have the financial capital to build in it. And often slums are in complex environmental settings where things like there is a high water table or um, there is uh, coastal flooding 
um, because it's the low value land that's left over from the, 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 the major development of the city. And so in this project, we are working uh, with a host of other universities and implementation partners to conduct uh, what I would call a kind of sympathetic evaluation of a new of um, a system called container based sanitation. Um, container based sanitation is basically a system of delivering sanitation using um, small scale sealable uh, containers uh, and then a uh, superstructure built around them. And people purchase not the toilet, but they purchase a contract for sanitation in the in and um, in many of the models of this approach, whereby they um, buy in regular emptying and they never own the assets, but the service provider owns the toilet and the superstructure. They bring it in and then they take away the waste on a weekly basis and so forth. So we're evaluating these types of systems in three cities um, at the moment in uh, Kenya, South Africa and Peru. And we're using a led by a professor at another university called Simon Wilcox, who is a expert in using mobile enabled uh, surveying techniques. Um, we're using an innovative system where we collect weekly data from users and in exchange for them completing our survey, we give them phone credit. And that's allowing us to create uh, these novel data sets that's allowing us to track how users experience sanitation over time. This is a really early cut of the data. We're in the middle of data collection, but I just wanted to show you this is another type of kind of applied evaluation that we do of real world sanitation interventions. And we're going to be using statistical techniques to identify whether CBS delivers better sanitation systems based on a measure, that measure called sanitation quality of life, which is a sophisticated service quality measure. And we're going to be looking at whether those benefits are durable over an entire year versus um, other types of toilets in these, in these slum environments. I'm going to now move on to the final bit of uh, kind of covering research that we're doing within our group at Leeds on this urban sanitation challenge. So we are we have a, a new area of newish area of work where we're really thinking about sanitation and climate change. This is a visual abstract from a researcher in our group uh, called Leone, um, where she conducted one of the first systematic assessments of sanitation impacts on non sewage systems, which was a key gap in the literature, looking at things like how increased rainfall, decreased rainfall, flooding, extreme weather events, and heat waves can intersect to disrupt or enable on site sanit um, non sewage sanitation systems. However, where I'm going, where we're going now with this work, particularly led by uh, again, Professor Barbara Evans, is work thinking about trying to understand greenhouse gas emission uh, profiles from on-site sanitation systems. And this is really novel new work, which uses both uh, novel empirical measurements of greenhouse gas emissions from different stages along the sanitation service, sanitation um, service chain on on-site systems, with modeling to create new estimates of how how much um, greenhouse gas emissions they're producing, particularly for methane and nitrous oxide, which are near warming gases that are a big problem uh, for climate change. And the estimates that are coming out of this work are really actually making people rethink about some of the fundamental challenges of how we manage sanitation going forward. It's not only a human right, but it's actually a massive area that we need to invest in to help bring down greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, in many cities, it's now estimated in develop in, in low and particularly low income countries, but low and middle income countries, the sanitation systems may be accounting for close to half of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in that city due to how much methane is being produced when all this waste is sitting there untreated at various points of the chain before it's either treated in a centralized facility where we can capture the biogas or, or, or just left to dispose of in the environment with no treatment. And globally, these types of sanita sanitation systems are now estimated to be uh, making up around 5% of total greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a, it's a big area that needs investment. So 
I've taken you through some of the challenges around urban sanitation and, and safely managed sanitation. Um, and where we are now really is that not only is uh, sanitation a human right that is not being realized, we're realizing the environmental cost of poor sanitation is even greater than just the immediate pollution in the watercourses. It's a globally significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, where are we going as the University of Leeds WASH group working on this agenda? We're really reorientating to think about how can we support what we call a just transition to safely managed sanitation for all. So we're doing that and just transition is trying to reduce emissions whilst meeting other social and welfare needs. So we're doing that through the types of research I've talked about. We're doing improved characterization and communication of the fundamental challenges in the sector. We are supporting evaluation of proposed solution, testing what works for who and in what context. We're doing novel and fundamental research into emerging issues, identifying next generation challenges. I would add here, I have lots of people, lots of colleagues who work on technical wastewater treatment as well, which I would put in this space. And we're doing system strengthening through our education. We run postgraduate and graduate courses in this area, and we provide learning and research support to governments and development sector partners. So you can read more about our work uh, via this link, which is a link to our blog, or the, which covers some of the WASH work, particularly our research students post here. And uh, with that, I would thank you for your time, and I'm going to pass back to Martin. Thank you very much, Paul. That was an absolutely enthralling and wonderful uh, presentation that you gave there. Um, probably just give you a moment just to catch your breath and perhaps have a, a swig of water if you'd like. Um, yeah, thank you. I definitely need a swig of water. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, and and uh, just a, a, a quick um, prompt. Um, if anybody wishes to uh, enter a question into the Q&A, box then please take that uh, opportunity now um, and, and similarly if you'd like to review any of the questions and we've got a good number of questions actually that have been posed if you'd like to review any of those and uh, consider upvoting them and then we'll try and prioritize those as we go through the Q&A um, during the rest of the uh, of the webinar okay so Paul um, are you ready to go with some questions I am yeah Fantastic. Right. Well, the first question that I've got, Paul, uh, is a pre-submitted um, question. Um, it's an anonymous uh, pre-submitted question. Uh, it's quite an interesting one, actually. Uh, given the expense associated with sewers and current wastewater discharges in the UK, is it possible that we, the UK, move away from centralised sewers towards decentralised systems or even on-site sanitation models? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. It's very interesting because where I live, although I live in Leeds uh, municipal boundaries, I live right on the edge. I actually have a septic tank. So I have a on-site sanitation system at, at my house. Um, there's two drivers here. In one sense, the centralization of the sewers is allowing us to focus on treatment and resource recovery and do things like capture the biogas and the methane. So I think in that sense, that might stop that happening. But there are big, there are, there are um, big drivers um, because of the investment that's needed to stop the combined sewer overflows. For new developments, I'm increasingly thinking they may emphasize uh, decentralized wastewater treatment systems. So in that sense, you would see, I don't think we're going to redesign settlements or, part, or parts of settlements that are already on the sewer network, but I can see increasingly for new settlements, there might be regulation that pushes them. We have a term that's used in the development sector, DWATS, decentralized wastewater treatment, where you might have, a, say, a set 100 households and they have a collectivized uh, system that and they end up having to uh, pay and manage for that themselves 
um, without the utility getting involved. So it'd be interesting to see how that's developing. The other option is in London, what's happening basically the the um, there's been massive investment in the tidal super tour sewer under the Thames, and that would be the other way we get around that. In big cities, we might see that replicated, but that will cost a lot of money. Mm. That's, that's very interesting. You mentioned sideway, Paul. Um, I was gonna. I was just thinking that while you were talking, and. Um, you know, I know that the planners um, are, are already thinking about well, what happens when the tideway, the tunnel reaches its hydraulic capacity, um, and what do we then look at? And so, decentralised systems, you know, particularly systems where wastewater is being um, treated um, locally, and you know, perhaps if resources can be recovered from that, nutrients, etc., can be recovered from that, then they can be reinvested locally. You know, as well as providing a you know a source of partially treated water, um, you know that can go on to kind of other beneficial uses. You know, watering gardens, that type of thing. So, really interesting. Um, so, yeah, first question then that's been posted um, during the webinar. It's a technical question. This one, Paul. Um, how much of the UK's population still don't have safe sanitation? That, that's from an anonymous participant. Well, so the way the data I showed, this is an academic answer, isn't it? The data I showed is from WHO and UNICEF, and it's for households. And um, it would indicate based on their estimates that the UK is at 100%, which is basically above 99% of having safely managed sanitation. But it, it there is work increasingly on populations that are dehoused, so people that don't have a dwelling. So they straight away are people that are at very high risk unless they have access in institutional spaces to not having safely managed sanitation services. And then, in, you know, if you actually talk to, for example, uh, utilities and others, there is uh, a problem they talk about misconnections. So there's lots of households that aren't connected properly into the sewer because either when they built the household, it was it was not done properly and the wastewater is basically flowing either through drainage or some other means into the environment and then there are i don't know the number but there's lots of people with septic tanks uh, particularly in rural areas which i think will not be desludging them in ways which we would deem safe and in rural areas as long as where the effluent's going out it's not a big issue but if you've got villages where people are living in and around them and particularly you know in the space where that effluent is going, then you could say that. The final thing is the bigger question. You could argue in when it rains heavily <laughs> and the combined sewer overflows are leading to mass uh, discharge of wastewater directly into rivers, you could say whole communities during those rain events don't have safely managed sanitation. Brilliant, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, question here then, uh, another technical question uh, from Ananya Ghosh. Ananya, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Um, are you saying having access to shared toilets is not considered as access to basic sanitation? Okay, this... Um, so I, I think my, my assessment based on doing some research in this space and uh, is that high quality shared sanitation is often the best sanitation option for certain populations, particularly urban settlements. However, there is epidemiological evidence that shared sanitation systems promote more um, disease exchange, higher rates of disease. So, in again, in the global monitoring for the Sustainable Development Goals, the WHO and UNICEF initially deemed um, shared sanitation as an as a unimproved or unsafe system. And lots of NGOs and development sector actors, in particular national governments, for example, in Ghana, shared sanitation is quite common. 
um, lobbied WHO and UNICEF, and they reallocated and created a new category called limited sanitation. So in this case, the system is properly engineered. If someone uses it, they're not, it's not like they're just going to the toilet over a hole. It's a properly engineered system, but it's not at the dwelling or the household level. So yeah, so yes and no, like like lots of answers end up being. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. I've, I've, I've got to ask this next question because this is something that I've never heard of before. This has been submitted by uh, Ian Frostley. Incineration toilets, I've never heard of an incineration toilet before, um, are extensively used in Finland and other countries in that area for isolated houses and cottages. Wow. Any comments? N no, I, I'd be interested in looking at the kind of energy intensity of those types of systems. I have had a student that did some work on sanitation in extreme cold environments, looking at Mongolia in the winter. And there are, you know, there's issues with the depth, for example, of pits where you effectively get a frozen pyramid of waste. So mm -hmm. they need to be sufficiently deep or offset in some way. And obviously you can't dig out or, it's, it's, you know, it's very, yeah, it, the permafrost makes it expensive to dig deep as well. So you have this kind of, you, you get pushed either way on this. But so I've never heard of that, but it's interesting for kind of deep, cold environments cause massive challenges mm. for water and waste because water freezes. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll certainly be Googling that later and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. learn some more about it myself, actually. OK, one more technical question. This is, again, is a pre-submitted question, Paul, and then we'll move on to some other areas. Um, this one is um, from uh, Richard Atkinson, um, and the question is, what are the best remediation practices for contaminated water, chemical and biological? How do you scale remediation? OK. Um, I feel like Martin might be better at answering part of that. I mean, you know, one of the things, particularly when we're thinking, you know, my space is this, for want of a better word, development space. So we're looking at resource constrained environments. So we always, you know, on the water side, if you're developing systems, we are always emphasize on finding, you know, the safest source. So the typical one, where I've worked on water is to do with groundwater contamination with arsenic or fluoride. And if you, you know, if you if you have an aquifer with that, then there is a big emphasis on actually saying, no, we need to find a surface water source or whatever. So the best remediation is finding an alternative source. Obviously, there are situations where the pollutant is in all sources or whatever. And then um, yeah, it it depends on what the pollutant is. I would yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd, I'd just add to that. I mean, my, my experience really is around wastewater treatment. Um, obviously, in the UK, we tend towards biological systems, um, you know, based on economy of scale, really. Um, but they do tend to be energy intensive solutions. Um, you know, a lot of the treatment capacity that was installed has probably been installed now 20, 25 years. And obviously, energy um, um, the cost of energy was a, was a lot lower then. Um, where I have seen chemical um, processes used, they tend to be in much colder climates. So here we're looking at um, coagulation, precipitation, and removal, um, you know, of of pollution um, from wastewater. And you know, those sorts of temperatures are the kind of temperatures where biological processes would be um, very inefficient um, or or may not um, happen. Um, at all, um, so that's that's my kind of experience and take on 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 that question. Um, so moving on, um, perhaps a, um, a a more political question here um, has been submitted um, by an anonymous attendee. Um, with your field of work being so political, what do you find that the largest barrier to your research is? Mm, the largest barrier. Well, I think, you know, I don't know whether it's a barrier, but I think we 
we do have to reflect and in, you know i'm a r relatively junior academic but i'm an academic and i've got research students and research students are good for telling you what you should be reflecting on because they're seeing all the trends and they you know there is questions around say for example decolonization should you know a white man at a global north university be you know, research, researching these questions, at least in a way where he tries to take power or, or or frames himself as an expert in some kind of exploitative way. So I think there are, there's kind of issues around international research generally, and development research, I think, especially. And I don't, I wouldn't say that's a barrier, but that is something that we're increasingly reflecting on. There has been exploitative practices where researchers in Global North have partnered with people, for example, local universities, local populations, and then just authored all the papers themselves and taken the credits and won funding, leaving, you know, not creating solutions for those spaces and not actually building capacity and not, um, you know, not respecting them adequately. So I, I think that's a that's a kind of tension and that's almost the politics of the research space, which I think is one way of answering your question anyway. But there's obviously lots of other political issues that I could have brought, uh, touched on as well. Good. That's good. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I see that we're getting quite um, short on time now, so I'm just going to ask one more question of you, if I may. Um, and again, this is a, a pre-submitted, it's an anonymous pre-submitted um, question. Um, when will the world achieve universal coverage of safely managed sanitation? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good one. So Great question to end. If you just put a linear projection, it's about 2070. But those aggregate... Um, statistics will hide vulnerable groups so for example you know de-house people in the uk it will also the the you know the way we categorize at that aggregate level won't for example look at minute you know relatively smaller sanitation failures or things like emergent contaminants that we might not be able to do deal with which leads to our waste being unsafe so it's it's an on, it's going to be an ongoing challenge whatever the case it's not something like oh tick we complete it because also all these services are operational services they need tasks to be done every day by skilled uh, people they need in continued investment so i think you know hopefully we move to realizing more or less the human right to sanitation but it then needs to be maintained fantastic Fantastic. Right. Well, I think that kind of more or less brings us towards the end of um, your bit, Paul. Um, my, my job really now is to thank you once again um, for a really informative and excellent presentation. Um, thank you very much for your uh, time um, this evening. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. OK, so um this brings us more or less towards the end of the uh, of the webinar um today um just a quick reminder really um that um we have another webinar next week um this uh, our next um uh, webinar um will focus more on some of the economics i suppose really around um, water management and will be um given by um one of our colleagues in the school of F uh, earth and environment um professor Julia Martin Ortega, who's a professor of ecological economics and an associate director of water at Leeds, actually, um, is going to give us a, um, a talk on looking at the economics of uh, restoration of peatlands, um, which, of course, are incredibly important when it comes to water management, um, but also um, around things like um, carbon storage as well. Um, so if you um, would like, if you're interested in seeing that webinar next week, please sign up to it. Um, there will be a link um, placed in the chat that will allow you to do that. Um, and once again, um, if you're unable to join, um, then the seminar series um, will be available on the uh, dedicated um, YouTube channel. Um, just one final thing, please, before we close, um, which is um, you will see a pop-up screen um, appear at the end. 
um, which will be a survey from the advancement team who have organized these webinars. Um, and if you could take a few moments just to uh, give you give 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 your feedback, please, um, that would be fantastic. Any feedback that you give is um, enormously valuable um, in helping us to uh, plan for future sessions. Um, so all that remains for me now is to thank you for your time um, and attention um, today um, and to wish you well for uh, the rest of the day. Thank you very much.